So of course, this work I'm talking about is joint with other people. Um, in particular, Alex Makis, my colleague at UT, uh, and Ajil Jalal and Ashish Bora, who were students at, at the time, although Ashish has now moved on to Google. Uh, so as, as mentioned, this is going to be talking about a, a modern twist on compressed sensing. So in order to do that, first I'll describe what compressed sensing is, and then talk about some of the new, fancier techniques that we've been developing in the last few years. OK, uh, and of course, feel free to stop me any time for questions. It's a long, it's a long talk slot, so, so no reason to rush. So first, compressed sensing. The idea is we want to recover some signal, like an image or some other kind of signal, from noisy measurements. And so this appears in many different places. So if they are doing an MRI, then you have a machine that applies some magnets and like measures some measurement of your brain. If you're doing astronomy, you place some telescopes, say radio astronomy, and you can measure some function of the different distance between the, the telescopes, the direction between them. If you're doing genetic testing, then you can mix together blood samples and measure how much of the bad of the gene you're looking for is in the mixture of the blood samples. Um, in streaming algorithms, which is how I got into this field, uh, you have some stream of updates, like a, a, a long list of URLs, and you want to know maybe which URLs appear really frequently. So in all these cases, you have some function, some underlying signal you're trying to learn. And you can't just look at the whole signal. You have some process that lets you access the signal. In fact, if you look more carefully at these, at these applications, the process that you can use is a linear process. What you observe is a linear function of the measurements you care about. So in medical imaging, in MRIs, the function is a sample from the Fourier transform of the image. And you can choose, based on how you apply the magnets, which sample you take. But over, you know, if in a limited time budget, if you're only going to spend 20 minutes in the machine, you can only take so many measurements. And so the goal is to choose as few linear measurements as possible to learn this underlying signal that you care about that you're going to then process in the future. And so the question then is, if I want to make sharper images with few, less expense, fewer telescopes, less time in the machine, so, um, then how, how do I do this recovery? How can I learn a signal from measurements? OK. So naively, well, there's n dimensions I want to learn. If I do you know, <laughs> simple linear algebra, I need at least n linear equations to, to uh, uniquely identify. So, but if you just think about it, um, most x aren't plausible. So here are two images. One of them I actually took from my phone, and one of them I did not. And is, is another. I, I took some linear measurements. I found another x that matches those linear measurements. You look at these. It's pretty clear which one. I took from my phone. <laughs> right. And if you were to try and quantify which one I took from my phone, <laughs> how, might you try, how might you quantify it? One way would be to look at the file sizes of these two images. And you'd find that one of them is 5 megabytes and one of them is 36 megabytes. 12 megapixel camera, 12 million pixels, three are red, green, blue per pixel. And so the right one is purely random. There's no compression. And the left one is compressible. And so when you store it, you store some compressed version. And so that means that there aren't really 36 million degrees of freedom. There's actually much fewer. There's actually more like 5 million degrees of freedom or even less. Because in 5 million bytes, I can describe what the image is. And so, it shouldn't, so I should only need to learn about 5 million linear measurements. And so ideally, what you'd be able to say is that in order to learn a signal, the number of measurements, the number of linear measurements you take, should be about the amount of information in the signal divided by the amount of information you get per measurement. And so then the whole game of the game is, well, given these measurements, how do I find a good low information image that matches my measurements? And how do I, exp how do I express the what it means for an image to have 
information. Like how do I describe, how do I understand images in a way that says that they don't have that much information? And how, how do I say that I get a lot of information per measure? If I can say that, if they say the, the numerator is low and the denominator, the, and the denominator is high, then I know that I don't need that many measures. Okay. So, in particular, compressed sensing, well, compression is saying that the image is compressible, means there's not that much information in what these images look like. And then if your measurements are incoherent, that means that you're, they're in different directions and they get information that's new, and so then you hope to say that you get new information. So this is how compressed sensing works. Uh, and the standard way, um, and so then the question is, how do you, you know, so the first question is, what does it mean to be compressible? How do you say that images don't have that much information? And so the most natural way you might say of saying compressibility is, well, we just looked at this on our file, on our file system. The image was five megabytes. That means it was compressible. Um, yes? No, because then you, uh, oh, sorry. Sure, yeah, a uniformly white image would be one. I mean, it's, it's your choice. It's not clear. Yeah, you, you need to understand some distribution over what you care about. Right, like maybe I am, like maybe there is some fancy structure in this that means that this is actually a very likely image. Right? You, uh, it's not, I chose it randomly, but like, you, you can't know that for sure. Right, so yeah, so under most reasonable models, an all white image would be very compressible, and you'd be able to learn that from just a few linear measurements. Because you'd say, oh, it is consistent with all white, and the other image is unlikely to be consistent with all white. So, what I mean is, uh, by your criteria, wouldn't the ideal image be one that is like contains one information, one piece of if, right, so, so it, it, yeah, right, so yeah, there, ex there exist images that are much, much less than five megabytes, right, if I do cartoons, then there's many images that are all much, much more compressible, and that means that you can then learn a cartoon from many fewer measurements, because you don't need to learn as much information to represent them, but you still have these linear measurements, so the all-white image, sure, is very likely, but after a few linear measurements, you're going to realize, oh, that's not the image I care about. And so you're going to look for an image that both is compressible and matches your linear measurements. And so then as long as you have some, so then you're going to want some class of these are the compressible images that you can then learn with a small number of linear measurements. And you want this class to be both expressive enough to represent the actual set of images that you care about, which in different domains may be different. If you're looking for, if you're trying to watch cartoons, that'll be a different domain than if you're doing MRIs of the brain, which will be a different domain from if I'm looking at a set of URLs on the web. Um, and so if I try, just tried to use the intuition I said before, you'd say, well, I want an image of short JPEG compression that matches my linear measurements. And if you could do this, this would be great. The problem is we don't know yeah, JPEG is some complicated compression process. We don't understand how to find an image of short JPEG comp rep compression that matches the linear measurements. And so the traditional thing to do is instead to look at how the first step of JPEG compression works. What does it do? You do some little 8 by 8 block Fourier transforms, and then you discretize the result. And the main way that that discretization helps is that a lot of coordinates become zero. That when you do these Fourier transform, you get a lot of zeros, or things that are near zero, and you just approximate them by zero. And in general, you can, uh, uh, you can say there's some basis in which your vector is sparse. So another basis 
which is what's used in JPEG 2000, is the wavelet basis. So if I take my image and I turn it into the wavelet representation, which this is the image taken from Wikipedia, you just, so it's a recursive transformation. The bottom left is, I think, so, so to do the recursive transformation, you look at every two by two block. And the bottom left is the sum of the top two minus the sum of the bottom two. And so if I have a horizontal edge, that'll be large. But if I don't have a horizontal edge, then it'll be near zero. And you can look at that, and there's a, a bright spot near the top of this castle. And then the, then the top right is the left two minus the right two. And again, you get, now you get edges when you have vertical lines. And then you get some diagonal thing, and you get the sum of the four, and then you recursively apply. And so you get some tree structure where, when, where there are edges, there's large values, and where there's no edges, where there's flat areas, then you get a bunch of zeros, or things that are near zero. And so this is the hard wavelet. There's other wavelets that can do a little bit better. And what happens is you're, you've gone from some vector that was not very sparse to one that is sparse, meaning that there's not many large terms. And so then the first, and this is great for compression because you can then forget all the, these large black regions and only store the regions where the values are large. And this is a very general property. So if you look at, so what I described was if I take an image in the wavelet basis. So here's a plot for three different domains of choosing a basis, looking for each i, the ith largest coordinate in this basis is what value? It's a log log plot. So these three, so there's images in a wavelet basis. One is music frequencies. They just took a, the first tenth of a second of a music video and took the Fourier transform and plotted the frequencies. And then this is looking at Wikipedia, um, how many times the ith most frequent paid receives, receives links. And in all of these cases, you see that there's Roughly speaking, a straight line followed by even further decay. And a straight line on a log-log plot means a power law. So it means that the ith largest core element is about i to the minus alpha for some alpha. That's typically between 1 half and 1. And in particular, this means that if you sum the squares of these values, they get smaller. So the sum of the square is like 1 over i to the 1.5. When you sum that squared, it converges. And so if I just take the top 1,000 coordinates, I will get the majority of the L2 mass of these images. And so what that means is now, so now we have this, this representation where I think that my images are k-sparse. And if 99% of the energy is in the largest k coordinates for some k, it's like 1,000, then the information in the image, well, there's this noise that, you do, that you're not representing. That's everything outside the top k. But if you're willing to allow a little bit of error, you only need to find these, lar these largest k entries, which only takes log of n choose k bits to describe. That'll tell you where you care about. And then maybe another k words to, to, to know the values of these k. But it's k log n bits of information that you need to learn. And ideally, if you do nice measurements, you'll get a constant number of bits per measurement. Now, this isn't always going to be true. If I, if my, suppose if my image is actually sparse in the regular domain, I took, look, take a random pixel, I'll probably observe zero, and then I would not get many bits of information. But if I do random measurements, or they're, so, or they're otherwise incoherent relative to the, the basis image that's sparse, then you can hope for getting constant number of bits of measurement, and then you can hope for getting k log n measurements required to learn a good estimate approximation of the image. So to be a bit more formal about this, um, so suppose that we have some vector x in Rn, that we, or there is some vector x in Rn, we don't have it. What we have is Ax plus eta for, for some matrix A and some noise eta. 
And for this talk, we're going to ignore eta. So, so the noise only comes from x not being exactly sparse. We're going to exactly measure x. It's just that x isn't sparse. It has some noise. And then what we want is we want to estimate x. We want to find some x hat that's close to x, where the error that we get is going to be proportional up to some constant factor to the distance between x and its nearest case sparse approximation. And I'm measuring the distance in L2, which means when you, you take the sum of the squares, that converges. Because 1 over i to the 1.4, sum for over i greater than k is going to converge. And so if you, if you were exactly k sparse, then this would say you need to recover it exactly. If you're not exactly k sparse, you're only approximately k sparse. This would be saying you need to recover it approximately. And for these power law distributions, you are approximate case sparse. You'll recover pretty well. In particular, if you think about how JPEG or MP3 compression works, they, they turn it into this basis in which it's sparse. They throw out their lossy compression. They throw out everything but the large entries. And they only represent the large entries. Here we're saying we're willing to tolerate a similar amount of error when we're doing recovery proportional to the error you would get from doing MP3 compression. Uh, and so the theorem by Candace romberg tau is that this is possible. Uh, and you can do this efficiently with the number of measurements that you would expect. Log of n choose k, which is k log n over k. And so if you only need 1% of the coordinates to do recovery, then you save a 1% divided by log 1% factor improvement. Uh, and you can, so you can, you can do this efficiently. And this is, in fact, optimal, we can show. So if you, the reason, just I'll give you a bit of intuition for why this is the best you can do for this guarantee, which is, let's take the k equals 1 case. Suppose x is random Gaussian noise with a single coordinate that's large. So now, if, and if you, if you scale it such that the Gaussian noise has norm 1 tenth, then in order to get the guarantee, your error needs to be less than 1. And so you need to figure out where this i is. Because to represent this well, you need to find i. Now I do any linear measurement. It's going to be vi plus v dot this noise. If I take any vector dot Gaussian noise, I get a Gaussian. And so I observe vi plus some Gaussian noise of a scaling that's as some scaling. Uh, and if you look at this scaling, what happens is you're going to get a Gaussian center. So if, if i is 1, you'll get a sample from a Gaussian centered at v1. If i is 2, you'll get a sample from a Gaussian centered at v2. If i is 3, you'll get a center, Gaussian centered at v3. And you can choose your measurements. So you can choose where v1, v2, v3 are. And so given these three measurements, you can reasonably well try distinguish them. Say, well, if I get something small, it's probably v3, big is probably v2, and the middle is probably v1. But you can't distinguish having a million. There's some limit to how much you can distinguish them. And this, is, this was studied by Shannon in 1948. He said this is an additive white Gaussian noise channel. And so the information capacity of this, the amount of information that v dot x carries about the coordinate i, is bounded by log of the signal to noise ratio. The signal to noise ratio here is the, the ratio of the variance of the signal to the variance of the noise. And because we want a constant factor of approximation, we need to tolerate a constant factor of noise, the signal to noise ratio is constant. And so we only get a constant number of bits per measurement. But we wanted to get log n bits in order to identify i. And therefore, for k equals 1, you need log n measurements. Um, in general, you can just place k coordinates, and now there's k log n bits that you need to learn. The same exact argument shows you get only constant number of bits per measurement. So, you, so this k log n that you got, that you can get according to Candace romberg tau is in fact the best you can do for this guarantee. OK, so this is all well and good background about compressed sensing. Now, let's see how to do better than this. OK. 
So again, the key equation is, of course, that the number of measurements you need to learn a signal is the information divided by the information you get. And if you think about something like MRI images, they are sparse in the wavelet basis. But how sparse are they? 7% um, sparse or something. And can we get a better, if we could get a better description of what MRI images look like, then there would be less information we need to describe a particular MRI. And so rather than having some description of MRIs that's just like a wavelet, describing sparsity on the wavelet basis, you can do in one paragraph. It doesn't require much knowledge about the domain. And so if we take 100 million MRIs per year, we should be able to describe what this domain looks like much more carefully and leave much less information to describe a particular MRI. So that the, new, the information content in an actual MRI is much smaller than you could get from any one paragraph description of structure. You should be able to learn from this data a much better, much richer description of what the manifold, the distribution of images looks like, and then use that much richer description as your understanding of the information in an image. And that way you can hope to make this numerator much smaller, use much fewer measurements. And so here we are, I guess 2020 now, um, and if I want to do, if I want to model images, what is the best way to do it? Well, today it's going to be using deep convolutional neural networks. Those have remarkable power in, under, in understanding, classifying, and producing images. And so the, what we're going to use as a way of understanding the distribution of images are, is generative models. So a generative model is a function that takes a random noise, z, from some known distribution, like IID uniform or IID Gaussian, feeds it through some convolutional neural network or even any other function, and outputs an image. And so you train these things. So most popular is with a GAN, generative adversarial network. And you start out training, and it looks kind of horrible. Uh, and then you do some more training, and you get a, a decent approximation to an image. This is with a five-year-old DC GAN. And so this, the output of this generative model is n. n reals long is the, is the size of your image. And so what we're going to do is we're going to replace k, the number of large coordinates, with k being, the, in some sense, degrees of freedom here is the size of the input. And so the hope is now, can we, can we replace k log n, where k was the sparsity, with something like k log n, where k is the size of the input to our generative adversarial network, or other generative ne model? Because then you can train a much richer representation than saying sparsity in the wave. OK, so in general, you want to model some distribution on images. And so we, we have some function g, such that if I feed in Gaussian noise, then g of z should be drawn approximately from the distribution that you care about. Uh, so GANs are a very popular one, way of doing this. So modern GANs, they can get, you know, Keras et al. produces faces like this. This is not an actual person. This is not Keras. This is just a, a hallucination of a person. And you can use this for other domains as well. So this is for astronomy. They produ can produce images of hallucinations of astronomical images. And this is for high energy physics. That is like a faster way of simulating what, what a process will produce. Um, and so given, but GANs are not the, only, uh, not the only game in town. There's other ways of producing generative models, like VAEs, variational autoencoders that have their own pros and cons. Um, and the question is, given, if we, if, 
deep learning people do a good job, they produce a really great generative model of what the manifold of images is. What can we do with this model? Does this give us the ability to learn, reconstruct images more efficiently? In particular, can we replace the fact of the, the, the assumption of x being k-sparse with the assumption of x being in the range of the generative model, or being well represented by this generative model. So more formally, we want to, again, we want to estimate x from y, which is ax, from a linear number of measurements. And in standard compressed sensing, you would want to be your error to be proportional to your, to your distance to the nearest k sparse vector. We're just going to replace that by the range of the generator, range of the just generative model. And so our <laughs> main theorem is that this is, in fact, possible with a number of linear measurements that's k times log n times d, where d is the depth of this network. So this is, sort of makes sense. If you have an arbitrarily complicated <laughs> neural network, I could approximate a space-filling curve. I could get close to any point in the space. So you need some measure of the complexity of how how tightly this general model can curve, but it's only linear in the, in the depth. Yeah. So for this model, we're assume this. So this theorem is for ReLU-based neural networks, and then we don't need that. It's the entire range of the generator on all possible inputs. Our second, th our second theorem, uh, and I guess the other, the other requirement here is that we need our measure linear measurements to be random. And that gives us a constant number of bits of new information per measurement. Our second theorem says, well, if I, have, if I, if I say that being a ReLU-based network is restrictive, I look at an arbitrary function, then if it's Lipschitz, I can get k log l, where l is the Lipschitzness, except the exact expression becomes a bit more complicated. <laughs> so you need, ins instead of being the entire range of over all possible inputs, it's only the range over a small ball. <laughs> or a ball, and that ball would be, if, I, if, my, if my samples are from IID Gaussian, then with high probability, no, the norm is about square root n, and I can make this ball be two root n. And then with high probability, your normal will be less. And then the other slightly annoying change is that there has to be a little bit of additive delta here, which makes this actually match in units. The units, right, because ellipsisness is output domain divided by input domain. And so to be a log, it needs to be a unitless number. So I need to multiply by input domain divide by output domain in order for it to be makes any sense. Um, yeah. Okay. They, so, okay, so I think the definition of exactly you know, what we want from generative models is something that's an open, a very interesting question of how to define them in a way that is both tractable and possible to test and is what you want. But people do want some level of coverage of the space because you know, one way of generating images that look real is to always give a, a picture of you. Uh, and that will look real every single time, but it's not representing the domain. And so people do want the, the result to be as close in distribution as possible to the original. Um, and to what extent they actually manage to achieve this is a question. Um, but people are trying to do this and, and developing methods to, to get there. Yeah, I mean, we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, okay, so it works in practice as long as you're on the same distribution that you have training data for. If it's a different distribution, then it gets more complicated. Uh, yeah, which is a, a general problem. But there, there, there are ways that get around that. 
future, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. Okay, so again, so the second result is, is much more general, it applies to any Lipschitz function, doesn't need to be a neural network, doesn't need to be relo based at all, um, and it's just only, and it's logarithmic in the Lipschitzness. But then if you think about a neural network, well, a neural network typically is going to have, so if it has D layers, and each layer has polynomially bounded weights, then each individual layer is poly n in its Lipschitzness. D layers, you get n to the D in its Lipschitzness at most. Log of n to the D is D log n. Um, and so morally, k log L and k D log n are probably the same, although there's again, People also can train to try and get more Lipschitz networks, and then maybe this would be smaller than the, the worst case, KD log. Okay, uh, so, and if you just look at this a little bit more, um, this is KD log n instead of K log n, which you might think is worse because it has this extra factor of D, but your K is hopefully much smaller because you have this <laughs> representation that is much more carefully calibrated to the distribution that you care about. Um, and then in terms of how to actually do this recovery, so the theorem is about saying if you could find the point in the range of the generator that is closest in L2 distance under your measurements, then the theorem is, then the actual G of Z is very close to the true image X. So if under your measurements it's close, then in actuality it's close. How do you find the point where it's close under your measurements? With gradient descent. Now, it's a non-convex problem. Is it going to work? I can't prove that. But the same problem holds for many other, many other questions in neural networks. We don't know how to prove that you can train these general models either. It seems to be tractable in practice. Uh, you can run it, and it seems like there's no that the approximation error is negligible. Uh, and then, and also, w once you do this recovery, you get some point, and you're not sure if it's right, you can check on measurements that, yes, indeed, this was, you, you can estimate how far you are from the truth. Okay. So, this, of course, is related to previous works, as always, as every research is. Um, so one line of similar work is on projections on manifolds. So it's instead, of, instead of representing a manifold as a neural network, you can just think about a general manifold and ask what properties of this manifold are required for how many linear measurements to find it. Um, and they give a number of conditions on which recovery is possible. Unfortunately, those conditions are ones that are not satisfied by neural networks. Uh, like they, want, they need smoothness and the results of neural networks are not smooth, especially if it's Arello, and they also don't, they can overlap with each other, which would, makes it not really a manifold. And then there's another line of work that looks at doing full training. So, so, so doing full end-to-end um, yeah, uh, -end training for this problem. So have a neural network that does the recovery from Y, which is AX, instead of do gradient descent on this general model. That works well. Um, it means that you now train your model for this particular task, as opposed to saying that we take a general model that was that was trained for a different for for just understanding what images look like and using them for this task. And they also don't get theorems for that. Okay. So how does this work? Here's the celebrity faces data set of beautiful people. Um, and so this is 64 by 64, three colors per pixel. So this 12,000 images, so 12,000 dimensions. And we take 500 linear projections. So we're taking many, many fewer linear projections. And so if you just do standard sparse recovery techniques, you can choose which basis you think it's sparse in, either DCT or Wavelet. And this is just way too small for them to get decent approximations to the faces. They need several times this to get a decent, even like, here you might be able to pick out that it's a face, but not much more than that. And here's what you get with our results. So if you take a trained DC GAN from 
years ago and apply it, then you can get, learn that these are faces and learn, roughly speaking, what these faces look like. Similarly for MNIST, um, if you just say, well, these are kind of sparse as is, do lasso, you don't have nearly enough measurements at 1 8th, but here we're using a VAE. Just to show it's not particular to GANs, you can use it for other generative models and it still gives a decent result. Right. Um, I don't remember how large the MNIST GAN is. Um, yeah, I think they have more parameters than in our data point was my guess, um, but probably fewer. There's probably more parameters than there are individual data points, but fewer parameters than there are dimensions of data points. Okay, yeah, that's to make my question more general. Like, is the size of the network kind of considered in GM's compression, GAT's compression? It's a subset. Right. So, yeah. so, I mean, the, right, the test data is, of course, test data that was not used for training. Um, the I think you know, if, if the, the goal is to use this for something like MRIs, how do you, okay, it's hard to get 100 million, get access to the millions of MRIs that are taken, but they are taken, and so like, an MRI company that has access to a lot of this data could just use that data, train a model, and then package it in with these things. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, so far we've, so we've focused on images where there already exists good GANs. Um, now, more recently there have become better GANs for larger images. Um, I think MRI size, they're still not there yet. the question of like how, how good the SSR of the results get after the measurement. Um, certainly the technology, like our technology is not yet good enough to be used immediately for MRI. I think that the approach should be that it's still the case that the brain with the tumor is a relatively low dimensional representation, but it's certainly also something to worry about. That if you, it, it, it is something to worry that you will then compress by throwing out the tumor to make it look much more normal. But it, once you get to a small enough, uh, an accurate enough representation, then the tumor you're looking for will still pop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the both models we have, right, 
every layer is lifted to some polynomial amount, d layers, it's bounded, you can take the log. Um, now, as with almost all theory results, if you were to run through our theory and look at what number of measurements you get, it would be much higher. I need to change the picture. It would be much higher than it are actually used. Um, getting the right constants, understanding for, an understanding for an actual generative model how complex it is, I think is a very interesting question. That there could be a much more fine-grained way of looking at a generative model and saying, oh, sure, it's not that Lipschitz, but the way in which it's not Lipschitz is very structured, and so it has, it's actually much less complex, the manifold that's produced. That would be interesting. Okay. So you can also do this quantitatively. So here's the number of measurements required for a given reconstruction error using our approach and lasso on MNIST and on the FACES data set. And as we see, you know, the picture I, the, the, the value I picked was right where we start working and the others don't, but there's a fairly wide gap between where we start working well and where others do. Um, so, I'll describe the proof for the first simpler theorem about ReLU-based networks. So, well, we, in order to show that KD log n measurements suffice, um, all we need to do is show that the range of this generative model lies in a union of KD to n to the K, dk k-dimensional hyperplanes. If we can show that, then analogous to proof of varsity, Right. For sparsity, you say there's n choose k hyperplanes, which is 2 to the k log n over k, so k log n over k measurements suffice. Here we're going to show n to the d k hyperplanes, so log of that, which is k d log n measurements will suffice. Um, and so if you look at a relu based network, every layer has some input z, multiplies it by some matrix, and applies the relu. What is the relu? It's this function that takes everything that was negative, every coordinate that was negative, and sets it to zero. And so the input to layer one is a single k-dimensional hyperplane. And what we're going to show is that the output of layer one lies within a union of n to the k k-dimensional hyperplanes. And then if you just repeat this, well, each of those after layer two will be in a union of n to the k. So there's going to be at most n to the 2k it will be within the union of n to the 2k in the second, after the second layer, and to the 3k after the third layer, up to union of n to the dk after the d layer. And so for this lemma, if you look at the R input, which is k-dimensional, then relu of a1z, you know, up to the choice of which coordinates get set to zero, is otherwise linear. So it's going to be a union of k-dimensional hyperplanes where the number is the number of different sign patterns that AZ has. So this is a little puzzle. How many different sign patterns can A times Z have, where Z is k-dimensional and A is some arbitrary plane, arbitrary set of n linear measurements. So let's think about the k equals 2 version. This is, so each coordinate, you know, ai times z is just a line, take the sign, and it's a hyperplane. So it's how many regions can n lines partition k equals 2, the plane, into. So if I just draw n lines on the plane, how many regions are there? And this, many of you may have seen before, the first line, you start out with one, the first line cuts it into, adds one more, the second line adds two more, Right. Every successive line is going to cross through all the others and add, the nth line will add n more regions. So there's n squared regions, and this generalizes to k. And so n half spaces divide rk into at most n to the k regions. So this is the lemma. This is that each layer goes from one, <laughs> expands each k dimensional hyperplane into n to the k hyperplanes, and so after d layers, you get at most n to the dk hyperplanes. Pretty simple, and therefore kd log n measurements suffice.
Make sense? OK, so all this is to say that if we want the number of measurements to be about the information in an image divided by the new information per measurement, then general models let you describe the information content of images as about kd log n, where d is the number of layers, k is the input dimension, and n is the largest layer of the output dimension. And then if your general model is differentiable, then you can optimize this in practice, and Gaussian measurements ensure independent information. And if you want a constant factor approximation, then there's a constant number of bits per measurement. And so that gives you this KD log N number of measurements. Okay. And so this gave us this theorem. There's been some follow-up work since. So outside, you'll find a poster by John. Uh, that's at Lou and Scarlett. That shows um, a matching lower bound. That this K log RL over delta is actually necessary. And we also had a concurrent work showing the same thing. And in particular, this plus delta term, which is a little bit weird because it doesn't exist in standard case sparse compressed sensing, is actually necessary. And you can't avoid it for Lipschitz networks because yeah, you, you can't avoid it. Um, now, if you have a better G, so our results, they have some floor to how accurately they can get, uh, because just the model capacity is only so large. And so once you have, even with infinitely measured measurements, you're still going to output something in the range of the generator, which isn't perfect. Um, and there's a nice work by Asim Ahmed and Han, Hand that shows how to use a fancier, more modern, more modern generative adversarial network to get better results, uh, particularly out of distribution. Uh, and then in terms of actually optimizing, right? we just do gradient descent and hope for the best, uh, one can show that this actually does work if you have a random network. <laughs> so if your weights are all IAD Gaussian, as they are at initialization, then you can show that this will converge to a, good optimal, a, a sufficiently good solution. Um, of course, after training, we still don't know how to prove it. And you can also do this, right? I described this for Gaussian linear measurements, and that's where we can prove a theorem. But you can do the same thing, and you can try it on other sorts of linear measurements or even nonlinear measurements. So here in painting, if I just block out a, a part of the face, then that's a linear measurement where my matrix is diagonal with a bunch of zero, some zeros on the diagonal. And you can just you can try the same process and hope for the best. Uh, and in this case, it works pretty decently. Um, or for deblurring, again, that's a linear set of measurements. So you can just try it, and you get some way of deblurring using incorporating this knowledge of what your distribution should look like. Um, and this, all this requires it doesn't even require your measurements to be linear. It just requires them to be differentiable. To try this, and hope for the best. Okay. So this is all about. Learning, you know, using a general model for compressed sensing. Yeah. yeah I'm Here I'm just doing the same. Yeah, just doing gradient descent because it's differentiable, you can do it. Okay. The last part of this talk is going to be about how you can instead learn your general model from compressed sensing like or otherwise noisy measurements. And because there's this, this problem. Where did you get your general model? The whole point of the previous part was that measurements are noisy. You're trying to deal with the fact that your measurements are hard to get or they're noisy, and so you're going to minimize the number of measurements you need to learn the image. But to learn these general models, they actually they take a lot of data. Right? Deep learning is great, but it's not very data efficient. And so if getting the data is hard, how do you get enough data to learn your model? And so in the, the, like, the ideal applications of this would be cases where you can't get this data. And so the question then is, can we use these noisy lower dimensional projections or otherwise limited observations of the data to learn the general model? Which could be useful in other applications, but also then can you, then, can you use that general model you've learned to now denoise better to do compressed sensing on future measurements. So let's see how this works. 
Uh, in a standard GAN, right, as seen before, you have your noisy, you pass it through some generative function, and you get a, a nice image. And the way you train these GANs in a generative adversarial network is you have another network that takes either a generated image or a real image, passes it through a discriminator, and the discriminator's job is to decide, was the image it got a fake image or a real image? <coughs> so, the gener so it's a competition between the generator and the discriminator. The generator wants to fool the discriminator by producing things that look real. The discriminator wants to figure out which images are real and which are fake. And there aren't great theorems about this, but you can say that if these are infinitely powerful, then the only pure Nash equilibrium would be when the generator actually produces the true distribution. Uh, when you're not infinitely powerful, we don't even know how to prove a pure Nash equilibrium exists. Interesting question, but anyway. And empirically, this works. But the problem is now, we don't have the real images. The real images are hard to get. We're trying to use this in a case where we only have noisy images. So how can we train a generative model without the real images, but with real measurements of these images? So we had some degraded image. The idea is, well, if we know what the measurement process is, so in this case, we just threw out 90% of the pixels. If we know what this measurement process is, then we can simulate the measurement on our generated images. So now the, now the discriminator's go goal, instead of trying to distinguish real images from fake images, is to distinguish real measurements from simulated measurements of fake images. So this is the idea, that if you understand the measurement process and the measurement process is differentiable, then you can, differential is a function of its input, then you can do the same end to end training, gradient and descent, to try and do a competition between generator and discriminator and get a good generator. And if your, generative, if your measurement process is sufficiently nice, you could even say that. In an infinitely powerful setting, the generated image would need to be drawn from the true distribution. So let's just try it in um, one example of Gaussian burr plus Gaussian noise. So this is a pretty simple problem. Um, if I just give you an image and I tell you it's from Gaussian burr plus Gaussian noise, and you want to know what is the original image, you just try and denoise a single image, then there's a standard answer for how to do this, which is Wiener decomposition. So the Gaussian blur, it gets rid of high frequencies, Gaussian noise adds those high frequencies, and so you, when, you, when you do uh, Wiener, de Wiener filtering, you, you tamp down those higher frequencies because there's just less signal noise ratio in them. And so a natural approach to try and learn a GAN, if I, if I only get a, if I get a data set of these noisy images, would be I do the best I can, Wiener filter, of all my inputs, and then learn a GAN of that. But of course, Wiener filtering <coughs> introduces noise. There's, there's filtering artifacts. It gets rid of the high frequency components. And so when you learn the GAN, then even if you have infinitely much data, you would be learning to produce these artifacts. And so this is the sample from the GAN that you learn if you apply Wiener filtering and then learn again. And it learns to produce things with artifacts. <laughs> and now, if you instead use ambient GAN, then you can get, so now it has significant artifacts at high frequencies, but the middle frequencies are much better. Because the, the middle frequencies like, even though a single image is not enough to learn what the middle frequencies are, many images are enough to learn what the distribution of middle frequencies should be. In fact, you can show that for this sort of measurement, the distribution of, measure, uh, of noisy measurements 
uniquely identifies what the distribution of non-noisy images is. So even though a single image does not uniquely identify, a single measurement does not uniquely identify a single image, the distribution of measurements does uniquely identify the distribution of images. And so then you can hope to learn, a much, so then if you have a finite set of data, you're not going to learn it uniquely, but you can hope for a much better representation of what that distribution is. Right, so for we certainly don't have any theorems on that. Um, for I'll show you for a different model what happens if we get get the noise process wrong. Um, we don't know. We don't know for we haven't tried it for this one. Um, you can do this for other measurements. Like if I just block out a sphere to do this in painting problem, then. If you try and do some naive in painting, you get horrifying results. And when you learn, when you now learn again on these horrifying images, you get a, you produce more horrifying images. Um, while if you do ambient GAN, then you get a little bit better. That it like actually learns that people have two eyes. Uh, now you can't get a theorem here because there could be long range correlations that it never learned. For instance, if, if I always block out one of the two eyes, then it could never learn that eyes are typically of the same color. Uh, it would only, and so, the, so it's not true that in, for this sort of measurement, the distribution of measurements uniquely identifies the distribution of images. Um, similarly, you can go the other way around. Say, suppose I just get a, a distribution. I only get photos, and I want to learn the distribution of what panoramas look like or full fields of view. Uh, and then again, even though this, our, our model has never seen a full face, it can learn what full faces should look like. Piece it together. Uh, here's dropping out individual pixels. It's like not nearly enough information to, to denoise an individual image. But when you, when you learn the distribution of images, you can get a decent job. Uh, Another thing you can do uh, is you can say, imagine you're in flat land, and you just see one-dimensional projections of things you look at. And you know that there should be a two-dimensional world out there, but you only ever see one-dimensional projections. Can you learn this higher dimension of distribution? And so here. We, so here we can do it on MNIST. We can't do it very well for face reconstruction, where it, even though it's never seen individual 2D images, it can get a decent approximation, an interesting approximation, to what this two-dimensional distribution looks like from only ever seeing one-dimensional projections. Um, and now there's a question about model mismatch. So here's for the... Um, they're just sampling pixels. So if my measurement process samples pixels at a different rate, then we can then our accuracy by a what's called the inception score, which is a really horrible measure of how good a GAN is. I wish we had good measures of how good a GAN is, but here is a, a, a measure. Uh, it drops. It drops if the if your estimate is wrong, but it still gets. It, it, it drops fairly gracefully. Um, and then you can use this for compressed sensing. So instead of, so as in the first part of the talk, if I observe AX for a random Gaussian matrix A, uh, then I, if I just give you a distribution of A and AX, you can learn what the distribution of X is. So here, the individual measurements are enough to learn what the original vector is. But they're only enough if you know what the distribution is. And so here, then you can use this for the, for the approach in the first part of the talk. And again, you get that the noise goes down. Not quite as much as if you knew the, if you had the, the best training. But you, yeah, you can learn the general model from, noisy, from a large distribution of noisy layer measurements and then apply it to a new one. And you get much better results than if you do some naive uh, lasso-based approach. And again, you can prove a theorem here. 
So overall, what this is saying is, if you have your GAN architecture of your choice, but your data set is not ideal, it has a bit of noise in it, then you should model this noise when you're doing greyhound training and learn a non-noisy distribution better. And so we can learn distribution that we have no data for the original distribution. Okay, so overall, what this says is you can use lossy measurements to learn a general model, and you can use the general model to reconstruct from lossy measurements. Um, and there's things we don't know, like yeah, I, I can say that the distribution of noisy measurements is suffices to learn, you know, uniquely identifies the distribution of original dis the original distribution, but I don't know any finite sample theorems to say what mid-range frequencies. If I get n data points, does that mean I learn log frequencies up to log n with Gaussian blur? Don't know how to say that. Uh, and the other question is about how to measure the, how to best measure the complexity of generative models. So we show that Lipschitz gives a bound, but there's reason to believe, right, if I have, say, say I have a general model for cats and dogs. So then it takes a continuous input space and it outputs some cats, some dogs. But there aren't cat dogs, points that are, you know, there aren't very many images that are halfway between cats and dogs. But in the input space, isoparametry says that there, there is a large interface between the inputs that map to cats and the inputs that map to dogs. And so your GAN is actually penalized proportional to how long it takes to move from cats to dogs. And so when you train this GAN, it's going to become very non lipschitz because it's penalized by how, how non lipschitz it is. How, how Lipschitz it is. But the way in which it's non Lipschitz is in just on this boundary that's a small fraction of the space. And so the overall complexity of the manifold is, I think, much less than you should naively get by looking at the Lipschitzness. Because there's a region in which it's nice and beautiful, a region that's nice and beautiful, and some complicated region in between. And so whether we can describe that in a nice, precise mathematical way, I don't know, but it would be great if we could. And then more generally, there's, I think, differentiable compression, right? This fact that we can now optimize over the space of images is really powerful and opened up a lot of new applications. Uh, and I hope to see more in the future. Thank you. So the key thing about neural nets is that they're differentiable. <laughs> and because they're differentiable, you can do gradient descent and hope for the best. And it seems to work. Um, right, I mean, we can prove that at initialization, when our network is, has random weights, that, the, that it's nice and it will converge. Um, we don't know how to prove it in general. I mean, for general networks, we know it's not true. Um, now. There are some results about over-parameterized networks, because if you have more parameters, it tends to be an easier manifold, but yeah, there is a disconnect. Uh, yeah, so, so, okay, so I guess a couple of things. So one is, you know, JPEG's a pretty old standard. There are better compression techniques that exist. Uh, and that have existed for years, but they're not much better. And so just changing a standard is a lot of work. Um, if you, you know, there are you know, people working on compression from neural networks. Uh, I think using it as a standard is a little tricky. Um, 
using it internally if you are Google and have a huge database of, of images that you just have to store, and you can store internally however you want, I think is, is going to happen first. Um, even there, you know, the, right, so, so there I, I suspect it will happen, uh, but eventually. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, you can use it. As I mean, we're using it with Redis. It's not. Right. It's not yeah. I mean, you need. Yeah. Yeah. You don't really need to. You just need to be able to do grain descent and hope. Okay. Any more? Otherwise, we can continue discussions offline. So let's thank Eric once more.